This first slide includes just some administrative details. If you are having any technical difficulties during the webinar, please refer to the slide for support. If you do not have a copy of the slides and would like a copy emailed to you, please let us know following the, uh, using the chat function and we will send you a copy of the slides. The next slide gives a brief overview of, this, of the webinar and the learning objectives. Participants may receive one hour of CPE, but in order to obtain this, you must complete an evaluation survey, which will appear at the end of the webinar. To comply with CPE requirements, we will show three different words during the, during the seminar, and the survey at the end will ask for those three words. If you have any questions during the seminar, please use the Q&A function to submit them, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. The Q&A window should appear on the right side of your screen. If you don't see it, hit the Q&A button in the top right corner of the screen, and it should appear for you. Okay, to get started, I'm gonna to introduce today's presenters. The first presenter is Walt Derengowski, CPA and CFE. Walt is a nonprofit audit partner at Delman Rosenberg and Friedman. He has been performing audits and other agreed upon procedures for tax exempt organizations since 2001, including trade associations, private voluntary organizations, and similar institutions. Walt's expertise in field office audits has provided him with the opportunity to travel to Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Europe for GRF's international NGO clients. He specializes in identifying risk areas, validating financial statements, and reviewing field office compliance with headquarters policies and procedures for nonprofits with international operations. Next, we have Andreas Alexandru, CPA. Andreas is also an audit partner at Goldman Rosenberg and Friedman and has been consulting for and auditing tax-exempt organizations for 20 years. His expertise includes audits and internal control reviews of nonprofit organizations, including associations, international organizations, private foundations, and other charitable institutions. He also specializes in federal compliance examinations required for organizations funded by U.S. government and other pass-through agencies. Both Walt and Andreas have spent their careers specializing in nonprofit audits and providing specific guidance to our nonprofit client base. To keep on top of new developments in the industry, Walt and Andreas both do extensive research and attend various trainings in order to assist in the education of Gelman, Rosenberg, and Friedman staff and our clients. I'm going to turn it over to Walt now. Okay, well, thank you, Lindsay, uh, for that introduction, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session today. It really is a pleasure to be here this morning to discuss the new FASB non-for-profit reporting project, ASU 216-14, as the standard is going to have a huge impact on non-for-profit financial statements. Andreas and I have both spent a lot of time reading through this new standard, and we are just both excited to be here with you. Now, I'm going to, going to start out by giving you a little background on the project and uh, how the standard came to be, the purpose of the changes, and some of the other background thinking of making these changes. And for over 20 years now, we have been following the GAP principles for financial statement reporting codified as ASC 958 for nonprofit entities, as well as ASC 954 for healthcare entities. And for years, the FASB Not-for-Profit Advisory Committee, in conjunction with other stakeholders, have stated that the financial reporting for the non-for-profit has been good. However, the financial information provided could be enhanced that would allow the non-for-profit to better tell their stories to donors and other users of the financial statements. Specifically, the, adv the advisory committee wanted to improve the reporting of net asset classifications, information regarding liquidity, and what does that exactly mean for a non-for-profit, including financial performance and cash flow in the financial statements, 
and the notes to the financial statements. But overall, they wanted to eliminate the, the complexities of determining the net asset classifications, as well as the inconsistencies of reporting financial information among the non-for-profit community. Now, back in April 2015, the FASB did issue an exposure draft that would address many of the concerns raised by the not-for-profit reporting. And in that exposure draft, they talked about presenting net assets in two classes, presenting cash flow using the direct method in the statement of cash flows, how liquidity is managed by the not-for-profit, reporting the underwater endowment funds in net assets with donor restrictions, and present expenses by nature and by function, including enhanced disclosures among cost allocations. The comment period for the ASU did end in August 2015, and there was definitely some mixed reviews. There were 264 comment letters sent in from the non-for-profit community. 85% of those letters were from preparers or auditors, and mainly from college and universities, healthcare providers, trade associations, and voluntary health and welfare organizations. And the remaining 18% were from users of the financial statements, uh, being academic individuals and others. And to gain further information, FASB did hold roundtable meetings and 10 workshops in five cities across the nation. And not all the feedback was negative. However, one of the main objectives they did receive during the process was to the proposed ASU focused on increasing differences between business entities versus non-for-profit entities. Because of this feedback they received by the community, FASB decided to, do, to divide the project into two work streams, being phase one versus phase two. And in phase one, it consisted of the net asset classification and the classification of those net assets, including increased board designated net asset disclosures. Also the underwater endowments and place and service option for expiration of capital restrictions versus overtime option. They also looked at the expenses, looking at the nature and the analysis of expense by function, also looking at netting of external and direct internal investment expenses against investment returns and uh, additional required disclosures around those inv investment expenses. Enhanced disclosures regarding cost allocation plans, information useful in assessing liquidity of the non-for-profit, and improving disclosures for those non-for-profits who choose to present operating measures, and lastly, methods of presenting the statement of cash flows and using the direct versus the indirect method. Phase two, on the other hand, actually picked up all the operating measures that were not included in phase one. And those elements came from the original discussions when they first started. And they did include whether to require some intermediate measures, whether and how to define those measures, and what items should not be included in the measure. And some alternative disaggregation approaches. They also wanted to further look at the cash flows and maybe realign certain line items within the cash flow statement. So discussions continued through December 2015 right into the first half of 2016, and they provided updates to the deliberations, and they finally finalized phase one on August 18th, 2016. And they issued the ASU 216-14 Non-for-Profit Entities Presentation of Financial Statements of Non-for-Profit Entities. Now, this applies to all non-for-profits, including non-governmental entities, such as charities, foundations, 
colleges and universities, healthcare providers, cultural institutions, religious organizations, trade associations, and other non-for-profits. So before I get into the details about when this new ASU will be effective, I first want to give you your first keyword that you must include at the end of the presentation and be able to reproduce to obtain your CPE certification. And that keyword is debit. Again, that keyword is debit. So now let's get back to the ASU and when it becomes effective. It begins for annual financial statements with fiscal years beginning after December 15th of 2017. And for those interim periods within the fiscal years beginning after December 15th of 2018. So what does this mean? Because everyone get, gets kind of confused about these dates. So the first to apply the new ASU will be calendar year ends December 31st of 2018. And for fiscal year ends, whether it's March, May, June, September, whatever that fiscal year end dates are, it will apply in fiscal year 2019. Now, when you adopt a new standard, you should apply it on a retrospective basis and you must apply all the provisions in the year of the adoption. You also need to disclose any nature of any type of reclassifications or restatements and what their effects were, if there are any. And when presenting comparative financial statement years, you apply all provisions of the ASU. However, you may elect not to include disclosures regarding liquidity, or expenses by nature and function in the comparative first year. Now you can early adopt the ASU, however you must apply the regular transition provisions at the time of the adoption. Now the key areas of the provision under the phase one does center around five particular areas. This ASU standard is almost 270 pages long. So we are not going to go page by page and point out what has changed, but instead what Andreas and I have done is gone through and we've grouped all these, all the key changes into five key areas. And we found it, it makes it a little easier to understand and get your arms around what is going, what is going to change. So you can see those particular categories on the slide, and the first one is net asset classes. There's going to be some changes there. The classification of expenses, including investment returns. Liquidity and availability, and some significant additional new disclosures required. The statement of cash flows, and reporting expiration of capital restrictions. Now, these five particular areas were not as controversial as the others, which were pushed into phase two. Now, starting to get into those five key areas under phase one, as I mentioned in the previous slide, let's, let's go through the first key area, which is net asset classes. Now, under current GAAP, we have been talking about unrestricted net assets, which represent undesignated and board designated. The temporary restricted net assets, which represents those net assets that are restricted by donor for program, program or time, and permanently restricted net assets, which are those endowed funds that must be invested in perpetuity. And for over the past 20 years, we have been disclosing and taking, talking about these net asset classes. So under the, the new ASU 216-14, unrestricted net assets will be known as without donor restrictions. And the temporary restricted net assets and permanently restricted net assets are going to be combined together and will be known as with donor restrictions. FASB decided that the complexities of trying to distinguish between temporarily and permanently restricted was just unwarranted 
and they thought that better information could be obtained in the notes about the nature, amount, and effects of those various types of donors' restrictions. So now we have the two net asset classes instead of the three. So for the first one, without donor restrictions, again, it's going to include the undesignated net assets as well as those that are board designated. And under the new ASU, you, you must disclose the amount, purpose, and type of board designation that include, that's included in the without donor restrictions. Now, many of our clients already include this information in their notes, but some do not. And now with the new ASU, it's, it's going to be mandatory to provide that information. The second net asset class with donor restrictions, as noted early, earlier, it will include all donor and time-restricted net assets. The notes will disclose the nature and amount of donor and time restricted at the end of the period and how the restrictions will affect the use of resources. So that will be required disclosures. Also, I, as I mentioned, those endowments that are invested in perpetuity will also be included in the with donor restrictions. I think one of the biggest changes here is the underwater endowments and that it will no longer be having to be reported in the undesignated portion, but now will be included in with donor restrictions. So this is one of the big changes with the new ASU. For those endowments and their required disclosures, you must disclose the non-for-profit's policy and any actions taken during the period. You must disclose the aggregate fair value of those endowment, endowed funds, as well as the aggregate original gift amount or the level required by the donor or law to be maintained. And the aggregate amount in which the funds are underwater. And not all funds are, are going to be underwater. It really depends on the fair value of the investments. And remember, as I mentioned earlier, underwater endowments will now be included in net assets with donor restrictions. Now, this does not relieve a not-for-profit of keeping the detailed records by each individual fund within the endowment. You are still going to have all the required documentation within your file. But when disclosing in the notes the financial statements, those aggregate fair values and original gift amounts will be at the aggregate level. Now, we wanted to give you uh, some examples of what it's going to look like. And this example is, is reproduced from the ASU itself, illustrating the presentation of the net assets in the statement of financial position which does reflect the two changes of net assets. So here in this example, right out of the ASU, it's an unclassified statement of financial position. Starting at the top, we have the assets. And if you notice that the statement has presented the accounts in a liquid format, as it starts with cash and cash equivalents and goes down to long-term investments. And they did break out the short-term investments from the long-term investments in order to better state the liquidity of the net assets. Then they deal out the liabilities. There's, there's no, nothing new there. But now getting into the net assets category at the bottom, as you can see, the terminology is changing as it presents without donor restrictions as well as with donor restrictions to give you a total net asset balance at the end of the year. And remember, it does not have to be, and remember, it does have to be applied retrospectively. They are showing comparative information here. So they, they have to, you do have to go back and, and restate those balances for the prior year to show the net asset classes under the new ASU. Now, please remember, this is just one example. You could give greater detail in the net asset section by breaking out the, maybe the undesignated and, and the board designated within the, without donor restrictions as well as give more uh, detail regarding um, the with donor restrictions by breaking out or showing uh, with donor restrictions from programs, 
from timing, or, or maybe uh, even from endowment funds. So you have the option if you want to disclose more information within the statement of financial position. Here's another example we produced directly from the ASU illustrating a uh, non-for-profit statement of activities. And so in here, they are presenting in columnar format the net asset classes that give you the information of revenue and expenses without donor restrictions and the one with donor restrictions. And as you can see midway down in the revenue section to give you a, the detail of what is being released from restriction. And, and they actually break it out with a, quite a bit of detail um, by the, the satisfaction of program restrictions, the satisfaction of equipment acquisition restrictions, the expiration of time restrictions, the appropriation from donor endowments, it gets you down to the total net assets released from restrictions, which gets you to the total revenues. And then here they are showing expenses pro programmatically in total program A, B, and C with management in general and as well as fundraising. They did have some other items that get you down to total expenses, uh, and then they get to the change in net assets for the year. And then they do the roll forward from net assets at the beginning of the year to net assets at the end of the year. But this is just one example. Uh, this one is in you know columnar format. And for some organ organizations, they they like to not show the columnar format. Uh, they maybe would want to show the without donor restrictions at, at, at the top and then underneath the show with donor restrictions to get down to the total change in net assets. So again, this is, this is one example a, a not-for-profit can use. I also wanted to give you an example directly out of the ASU of a note disclosure of how they reported the detailed information for with donor restriction. And remember, it's now required to disclose the nature and amount of all the donor restrictions, including those time restrictions. So starting at the top, they actually showed what was subject to expenditure for a purpose. They did break it out, and they did provide a lot of detail for program A, program B, and a little bit in program C, buildings and equipment, annuity trust agreements get to a subtotal for those that are purpose restricted. And then it shows you the time restrictions and a subtotal. And then the next section, which is new, you will see the subject to non-for-profit spending policy and appropriations. But it gives you the endowment and the accumulative earnings not yet appropriate to be spent as of this particular point in time for the year. And as you could see, they did put the original gift amounts of the in, in investments in perpetuity as part of this process to get to what is included for the endowments. The next section discloses uh, subject to appropriation and expenditures when a specified event occurs. So some, some disclosures there. And the last one, not subject to appropriation or expenditure, but it, it's land required to be used as a recreation area. So the land is restricted. So they broke broken it out into the different sections to get to the total net assets with donor restriction at the end of the year with a grand total of 193,000. So I wanted to give you another example of just the endowment net assets. And this is just a particular or a partial disclosure because remember, you still have to disclose your return objectives, the risk parameters, your strategies of, of employees for achieving those return objectives, and you know, just spending policies and the overall policies, and including reference to the governing law and the uniform prudent management of institutional fund acts. So this is, is, this is an example is to give you a, a snapshot of what the note would include as far as the what the composition of the net assets is and, and the roll forward of the activity for the year. So the first box on the top of the page is just a snapshot of what the net assets are. And as you can see, it is in columnar format. It has without donor restrictions and has 
with donor restrictions with a total. So remember those board designated endowment funds, they are included in the without donor restrictions, but they are the, the quasi endowments, so they are included in this footnote. And then it shows you the donor restricted endowments, breaking out the original gift by the donor, the accumulated investment earnings, and then in, in this example, they also have a little term endowment that is being spent down to get to, to their total of with donor restrictions. And the second box shows the roll forward from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Notice here that the endowment net assets at the beginning of the year has been restated to show the net the new application of the new ASU. So it's without donor restrictions and with donor restrictions. Again, you have the quasi-endowments within the without donor restrictions, and, and all those endowments invest in, in perpetuity in the column with donor restrictions. I also want to highlight the investment return, and, and Andreas will discuss this further in detail, but as you could see, investment return is presented net. You no longer are having to show the components of those, those investment returns. Then it goes on to show the appropriations of endowed assets for expenditures during the year, but from the quasi-endowment and the true endowment. And then it also shows some board-designated endowment funds coming in get, to get down to the endowment net assets at the end of the year. So again, this, this is just an illustration that is reproduced from the ASU to give you an idea of what's, going, what's it going to look like. So now I am going to turn it over to Andreas, but before I do so, I want to give you your second key word of the day, and the word is endowment. Again, the, the word is an endowment. Now Andreas will take you through the other key areas of the new ASU. ASU. Thanks very much, Walt, uh, and thank you all for joining the webinar today. Uh, I will cover the next uh, four sections of the five areas that we, that Walt had mentioned earlier at the start of the webinar. Uh, the first section, classification of expenses, including investment returns. Now under the second key area, organizations are now required to present their expenses by function and nature in one specific statement in the financial statements. This presentation by natural classification and functional classification can be reported either on the face of the statement of activities in a separate statement or in the notes to the financial statements. Many organizations currently are presenting functional expense statements in their financial statements so this change may not necessarily affect how you report within your organization, but if you haven't been reporting on a functional level in the past, this will require you to do some additional work in collecting information to ensure that the information is accumulated and available to be presented in the financial statements. If you were preparing a functional expense statement in the past, there's a part of this that will affect you as there is now a requirement to disclose the method used to allocate those costs by functional category, by program and supporting services functions. For example, you may have to include in the footnotes that the expenses are allocated by square footage, salaries and benefits based on time and effort, assuming you have a timesheet system in place or other after-the-fact determination of how time is accumulated and recorded in your financial statements. And this information will now need to be added into your footnote disclosures. Included in this section are some new requirements on investment returns. There are some inconsistencies that were noted in how investment returns were being reported so now the organization must report investment returns, net of external and direct internal investment expense. 
One thing to note, this can be repeated in multiple areas if you present your investment income in different parts of your financial statements, such as if you have investment income from operations shown separately, then certainly that is an acceptable presentation. Under the ASU, there is no disclosure of the net expenses required. Also, the requirements with respect to the disclosure of the components of investment income have changed as you are no longer required to disclose the components of investment return. So once you've performed your expense analysis in the first piece of this key area, you should ensure that the direct internal investment expenses are not included there as they will be netted against the investment return. Additionally, there's some guidance in the ASU on the allocation of management and general expenses which I certainly encourage each and every one of you to review. Um, there's some good information in the documents. Moving over to the next section, liquidity. The requirement for the organization now is to disclose the qualitative and quantitative information on liquidity. Under the qualitative section, there is a no disclosure that will be required on the liquidity and availability of resources within one year of the date of the statement of financial position. There is also a quantitative requirement, and this can be completed by no disclosure or on the statement of the of financial position. Included in the quantitative requirement is the availability of the not-for-profit's financial assets as of the date of the statement of financial position to meet the cash needs for the general expenditures within one year of the financial statement date. So financial assets, which are tangible liquid assets that are not restricted by external donors or internally by the board of directors, as you look at your statement of financial position, you take those total assets, subtract out the total non-financial assets, such as inventory, prepaid expenses, um, capital assets. Once you subtract those out, that will bring you down to the total of the financial assets. The availability of a financial asset can be affected by several things. The nature of the financial asset, external limits set by donors, or internal limits imposed by the board of directors. We have some examples that the ASU has included that will give us a guideline as to how this should be presented. The first disclosure here is a quantitative disclosure presented in a table format. We first start with the financial assets as of fiscal year end. We subtract out those that are unavailable for general expenditure within one year. Here you can see that the funds are restricted by donor or contractual, if there are contractual restrictions or board restrictions, which now takes you down to the total. Uh, indicating which financial assets are available to meet the general cash needs that are required for the upcoming fiscal year, fiscal cycle. You do have an option to present it in a different fashion, as there are still various ways that we can present this information to meet the requirements. You can also start with the total assets, back out, uh, the other assets, including capital assets, prepaids, inventory, investments, and other non-financial assets to come down to the net financial assets at year end, as is shown in the table here. Or you can list out those components that make up the financial assets, such as cash, receivables, investments, to come down to the total of the financial assets at year end. 
So you do have a choice as to how you would like to present it. There's also an option to present this information in a paragraph or word format. So a table is not required. In the end, it is up to the organization as to how you would like to present this information. We believe the word format might be a little bit too difficult to read or too complicated to understand. It's still up to the organization as to how it identifies the information, how it presents it, but perhaps the table format may still be an easier read for those reviewing the financial statements. We're presenting here a qualitative disclosure, which is based on the liquidity and the availability of resources available within one year. There are some examples. Uh, I definitely suggest that you look at some of those and come up with ideas that may impact your organization. The important point of this disclosure is that they are substantially supported with restricted contributions and they must maintain sufficient financial resources to meet those responsibilities and needs. The financial assets may not be available for expenditures within one year. Also, the states how you have met your needs by invested cash. You may have surpluses, liquidity reserves, or a reserve or a fund to draw on in the event of financial distress. Many organizations maintain a line of credit when there are liquidity needs, or there may be other anticipated liquidity needs. Overall, this will require a bit of thought to ensure that the organization has complied with the new standards. Moving into the next section, statement of cash flows. In the original proposal, they require that organizations use the direct method of cash flows, which in the end turned out to draw a lot of attention by the not-for-profit community. And ultimately, it was decided that the organization had an option of electing which methodology it wanted to use, whether it be direct or indirect, as far as presenting this information in the financial statements. If you choose the direct method, you do not need to show the indirect reconciliation that was generally shown at the bottom of the statement of cash flows when you use the direct method. There were many comments and responses to the initial proposal, uh, both advocating for direct as well as indirect, but many of the smaller organizations pushed to present the indirect method the position was that the direct method was going to be too cumbersome uh, and challenging and generally a lot of work. The smaller organizations and preparers were quite concerned about the cost of presenting the direct method outweighing the benefit of the other presentation. In the end, a decision was made to allow for a choice between the direct and indirect presentation. So it's up to the organization to elect which method it would like to use. Many other areas in this standard were not as controversial or required as much deliberation. This is one area where there was not a unanimous decision. Uh, in fact, it was a very close, uh, it was a very close decision to allow for both methodologies. Moving into area number five, reporting expiration of capital restrictions. If the not-for-profit has cash and other assets that it has received to acquire or build other long-lived assets, such as a building and other capital projects, the organization is now required to use the place in service approach in the absence of donor imposed or implied restrictions. This eliminates the option to release donor imposed restrictions over the estimated useful life of the asset. 
In the past, organizations could use the placed in service method or over the useful life methodology, which essentially is a mechanism to release the restriction through the passage of time, through the depreciation and amortization of those assets. Either option was acceptable. Now, under the standard, you can no longer use the implied time restriction methodology. As an example, if an organization has a capital campaign to construct a building, the organization would receive contributions recorded as revenue with donor restrictions and reported in the assets with donor restrictions until the building is placed into service. And at that time, the entire balance of the restricted funds received would be released immediately and not over the estimated useful life. So there would not be a matching of the depreciation over the life of the asset with the release of restrictions from restricted revenues. The critical part of this is that this treatment is applied on a retrospective basis. So if you have other assets that have been developed or acquired under similar circumstances and you are releasing the revenue over time, then the organization must show a prior period adjustment to record the release of the remaining balance of the temporarily restricted net assets and have that net asset without donor restrictions as of the beginning of the reporting period. Okay, we are at the final key word. The final key word is restriction, restriction. On slide 24 that you see on your screen, we have a to-do list. And at a high level, the purpose of the webinar is to provide information about the ASU and to allow those attending to ask questions. The other purpose of this is to provide a to-do list so that when time comes for your annual audit, the organization is ready for uh, the audit in accordance with these new standards. First and foremost on the to-do list is the organization should identify a champion to oversee the implementation of the ASU senior management should be involved. Senior management should be involved because they should really understand the changes and the impacts on financial reporting, as well as oversee the implementation, especially during the preparation of the new disclosures. Organizations should review the FASB PDF version of the ASU. If you haven't referenced it already, and as Walt mentioned earlier, it is 270 pages long, but there are some great examples in there and it can be very useful for all organizations. The FASB has not completed phase two at the moment as a large portion of the content in phase two is still pending. Number three, provide training to all staff via in-house trainings, external seminars, webinars, etc. cetera. Um, this is not just for accounting staff. This is uh, a good source of information for development and others within the organization. It's important that everybody be aware of the changes, especially the new revenue classifications. Number four, review systems in place and update internal controls as necessary. Some internal control documents that you may have will now include some outdated language including references to permanently restricted net assets, temporarily restricted net assets, et cetera. You will need to update the terminology. And some of the other areas governing the functional classification of expenses may require a look at the definitions of functional classifications. 
and those updates should be reflected in the accounting policies and procedures manuals. Start thinking about liquidity and what that means to your organization quantitatively and qualitatively. We should start thinking about the disclosures now. It's never too early to start looking at these changes. And when the time comes for you to comply with these changes, and then following that, when the audit time comes around, it's good to be in line with those standards and certainly ready for the external audit process. And the last piece, review existing notes of the financial statements and identify all notes to be updated for the new ASU. Again, at a high level and most importantly, for the organization to be ready for its external audit. Other implementation areas, you may uh, being, you may include some of the changes in the ASU. However, you cannot include the following without the formal adoption of the ASU. Number one, the presentation of two classes of net assets without restrictions and with restrictions. We will still, at the moment, have to keep the current classifications of temporarily restricted net assets and permanently restricted net assets until the adoption of phase two. Underwater endowment accounting, eliminated disclosures of investment return components and netted expenses, and the eliminated requirement to provide indirect reconciliation under the direct method of cash flows. In the final section, we have an update here on phase two. Phase one has been finalized uh, as it was published during August of 2016. However, the FASB is still deliberating phase two that are included in phase one. And some of those items that are currently being deliberated are around the operating measures and intermediate measures and if they should be required and how to define those measures in the update. There was a lot of discussion and pushback for the not-for-profit community when it came out under the proposed ASU in 2015. So they're continuing to take a look at what that will look like once phase two is concluded. Statement of cash flows, option of choosing direct or indirect. They're still looking at perhaps making some changes here as well. They want to look at the, uh, the items and realign them to better present the cash flows from operations. So there may be some changes to what we've shown in our illustration earlier. There's also a section on segment reporting for not-for-profit healthcare entities. At the moment, the anticipated completion date is unknown. It won't be known until phase two deliberations are completed. And there is a comment period where feedback is accepted by the FASB. Uh, one thing that is very important to note is that the, the not-for-profit community should be involved in influencing the decision. Uh, so any comments that can be provided, certainly we encourage you to provide those comments in order to make sure that collectively as an industry, we are pushing for the same changes changes that are going to be uh, adopted in phase two. Your impact could certainly influence the final decisions around intermediate measures and operating measures in the second phase. This concludes sections one through five of our presentation. Um, I am going to push this back to Lindsay, who's going to uh, take comments and questions, and we will be answering those questions. Hi, thanks, Andreas and Walt. That was a great presentation, and we do have a few questions to go over. So first of all, can you please clarify that the components of investment income are no longer required to be disclosed? Andreas, would you, would you like to field that question? Sure, uh, thanks, Lindsay. 
in the organizations of financial statements, there is no longer uh, a requirement to disclose the, the gross components of investment income, such as the unrealized gains and losses on market fluctuations or fair value fluctuations of investments, and the realized gains and losses on the sales and liquidations of investments. So those components do not, they no longer need to be presented in gross format. We are presenting them, we will be presenting them in a net presentation. Great, thanks for answering that question. Um, here's another one. When you apply the ASU, what happens to underwater endowments that are already included in the unrestricted net assets? Um, Walt, would you like to field that? Uh, sure, thanks, Lindsay. Um, now, remember, as, as Andreas and I, we, we mentioned earlier, you're going to have to retroactively restate. So you're going to have to restate the opening balance and restate the net assets to move these deficiencies to net assets with donor restrictions. Okay, thanks very much for that. Here, okay. What happens if you have a negative ending balance for liquidity in the quantitative disclosure? I'm gonna give that one to Andreas, if you wanna take it. Sure, thanks, Lindsay. Um, here, we would definitely want to strengthen the qualitative disclosure of how the organization will hedge this negative liquidity and availability of funds in the notes, the financial statements. Uh, and one way to do it, as we mentioned earlier, would be to present uh, something in a text format or a word format that will accompany the reconciliation of the financial assets in the in the footnotes of the financial statements. Okay, thanks, Andreas. Um, how about could you please go over the effective dates again? Maybe Walt, if you want to take that. Sure. Um, you know, they <laughs> with that, any new standard that that they come out, they always they always uh, throw a curveball. So, um, so the first apply to new ASU will be calendar year ends uh, December 31st of 2018. And if you are a fiscal year end, um, you know, March, May, June, September, you will apply in fiscal year 2019. Hi. Uh, here's another one. Do we need to make some changes to our existing chart of accounts due to the new ASU, or are we okay as we are? Um, Andreas, do you want to answer that one? Yes, thanks, Lindsay. Um, certainly, we will take we will need to take a look at the uh, at the chart of accounts uh, for a couple different reasons. Uh, organizations will need to track all the restricted revenues received by the organization, and perhaps the existing chart of accounts uh, may not, currently may not have that capability uh, or it may not be structured in that fashion. And so certainly if we're tracking restricted revenues, we will need to update our chart of accounts. Uh, and another, another point here would be uh, cost allocation, which applies to any kind of organization. Traditionally, this is more critical in a 501c3 organization, but this applies to C4s and C6s and others where a uh, functional allocation of expenses is now required. So if the general ledger accounts currently don't address functional distribution of costs, then the organization will need to update its definitions and its policy statements uh, in its accounting policy and procedures manual. Okay, thanks, Andreas. Um... Here's a question that just popped up. Is there any difference in having to follow these regulations based on the size of the non-for-profit? Thank you, Wendy. I'll, I'll take this one. No, it doesn't matter the budget size of your organization. You are going to have to apply this new standard 
um, the new ASU 216-14, regardless of the size of the organization. Um, okay, thank you. Maybe maybe a couple more questions. Um, can you please clarify where board designated endowments will be presented in the statement of financial or the financial statement? Um, and if if Walt, you want to take that one as well? Sure. Um, a very good question. Um, the board designated uh, endowments um, will will be presented. Uh, and included in net assets without donor restrictions. Okay, thanks very much. Um, looks like we're we're pretty much out of time here. I just wanted to thank Walt and Andreas again for a great presentation, and hopefully some everyone got some good information. If there are any additional questions that we didn't get to, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, the emails are on this last page. And we are here to help with the implementation of this. So again, feel free to reach out. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone to take the survey that should pop up at the end. And the, the three words that were stated during the presentation will need to be entered in order to obtain the CPE. Um, and as I mentioned, this webinar was recorded and will be available shortly following this presentation. So if anyone wants to we listen to it, it will be available. So thank you everyone for your, your participation and have a great day. Thanks.